Well, welcome to lecture five in social neuroscience. This one's all about the endocrine system. And the endocrine system is talked about mostly in chapter four of Sapolsky's Behave book. And you can also find some supplementary information that he provides in appendix two. Um, so I'm gonna give you an overview of the endocrine system and try to introduce some key hormones that we care a lot about in social neuroscience, but believe me, we care a lot about the endocrine system just generally, and there are many hormones that we could have focused on. So in this lecture, I'm gonna talk about, just first of all, an introduction to how cells communicate with one another, just to give us some context about where the endocrine system does its job. We're gonna talk about what hormones do. Then we'll make a distinction between peptide and steroid hormones. We'll talk about how the brain controls hormones and production and where they get passed around. Um, we'll also talk about how hormones can influence the brain. And finally, I'll introduce those three key hormones that you should know for this course. All right, so as an introduction, let's talk about four ways that cells talk to each other. Now, what I mean by this are cells anywhere in the body, not just neurons. So how do cells in the body generally talk to each other? And what we can do is we can break this down into the type of communication. That's one of the four ways. I'll give you a brief description. And then notice how these four ways of how cells talk to one another differ in their range, their speed, and their specificity. So one way that cells can contact each other is just through direct contact. That is, in different types of development, for example, cells can physically touch each other. And when they touch each other, they can basically have their membranes touching and it's short range. It's fast, um, one in, neuron can, sorry, one cell can influence the next one. So this is very much like a one-to-one -one transmission of information between one cell to another. This is analogous to like passing a note to a neighbor. There's the paracrine type of communication and paracrine here, what happens is the cell produces a signal to induce changes in nearby cells, altering the behavior of those cells. For example, when, again, we're going through development, cells will signal to one another that they're active or they need to other cells need to activate to coordinate their growth so the cells maybe for instance grow tissue together so as the cells do this they're basically sending a very short range communication between the cells that are just nearby and it can be fast it can be slow but the general idea of the specificity here is it's sort of like affecting the surrounding area of that particular cell it's like whispering to your neighbors now a third way that cells can talk to each other is neuronal. And this is actually really a form of the paracrine communication. But in neuronal, this is what we've been talking about in previous lectures. This is how nerve cells work and they use synaptic signaling where they can signal to one cell to the next by inducing changes through neurotransmitters. And this can be like quite long range, right? You can have axons that go uh, up and down the spinal cord, for example. And so there's a lot of um, long range and short range uh, transmission here. It's fast, so we've talked a lot about how fast action potentials can move down the axon. Ax the axon. Um, and it's highly specific because the neurotransmitters there at the terminal buttons are um, possibly affecting only certain neurons that are right nearby that have the receptors for those neurotransmitters. So this is sort of like sending a text to a friend. So you very specifically quickly want to send a text to somebody else, this is how you would do it. And then finally, there's the endocrine way to have cells talk to one another. And basically the way this is done is with hormones being released into the bloodstream in a very diffuse fashion that goes throughout the entire body. This can be long range, of course, because the blood's gonna go everywhere. And so that means that the hormones that are following along into the bloodstream get passed all over the body. This is a very slow way of communicating between cells. It is widespread, so it's not really specific. Um, so it's like sending an email to a group of people, okay? So those are our four types of communication. And of course, what this lecture is focusing on is this fourth way of communicating. You know, why in the world do we have hormones that do this? Like, why do they pass their communication throughout the bloodstream in this very slow fashion relative to, for instance, the neuronal ways of communicating? So what do hormones do when they pass on their signals to another cell? Well, what hormones do is two general things. They um, help organize um, structures, and they, so this organizing effect is that they cause permanent structural differences to develop gradually in the body. And this happens particularly through uh, childhood where you're you know, basically building the framework of a bigger and bigger body and the brain is changing and so on. So 
as that all happens, this organizing fashion is largely being done through hormones that are being passed around in the bloodstream. The second way, though, that hormones have their effects is by their activating effects. And what happens here is you can have changes um, that happen temporarily, and it can cause this sort of temporary behavior to occur over seconds, minutes, hours, or days following exposure to the hormone. So for instance, some types of aggression could be due to a hormone that's being released, and then that hormone's in the in widespread in the body, and it just continues to make the animal or the human um, continue to be aggressive for a while as long as the hormone is high in the system. So those are the two major effects of hormones. Now let's go ahead and drill down a little bit and talk about the two major classes of hormones and those would be the peptide versus the steroid hormones. Okay, so some hormones are peptide hormones and some of them are steroid. It's not really important to understand chemically how they are structurally different, but I wanted to talk a bit about how they're functionally different because it does matter um, whether we're talking about peptide and steroid hormones and how they have their uh, effects in the body. So hormones have their effects on cells, specific cells, in two different ways. One is the hormone can have a direct effect on the cell and specifically on the nucleus of the cell. And the second way they can do this is through a second messenger effect. Now in this diagram, you can see the first one, the direct effect of the nucleus. So what this means is that the hormone is going to be received by the cell, and then the cell takes it in, enters through, passes through the membrane, and continues to go on and to affect the nucleus. And there, when the hormone gets to the nucleus, it can bind to receptors in the nucleus and trigger DNA that produce mRNA, and then the mRNA can cause the synthesis of new proteins, and these new proteins maybe change the structure of the cell, what the cell does, how it responds to other cells, and so on. The other way that hormones can affect is when you see at the bottom there, it's the second messenger effect. And this is where you have a specific receptor that the hormone latches onto, like a lock and key. And so the hormone doesn't actually enter the membrane of the cell, but what happens is it causes that receptor to release like a protein that then gets sent off towards the nucleus and has an effect on the functioning of that cell. So it's not directly the hormone making the changes. The hormone is just basically signaling at that receptor site that something else should happen inside the cell now. So those are the two main ways that hormones have their effects on cells throughout the body, including neurons. Now, peptide and steroid hormones differ in the way that they affect these cells. So I've made a little table here to show you that. So in terms of receptors, the peptide um, neuro, uh, hormones have their receptors on the cellular membrane. And so, as I said, this is like the secondary messenger process, the second way that hormones can affect um, their cells. And so here, peptides are received on the cell membrane. They don't pass through the membrane. Steroid hormones, however, are able to diffuse that membrane and then bind with receptors that are within the cell, including at the nucleus. So their receptors, those steroids are just passing right through the membrane, like you know, there's, like they can just get through the door. But once they're inside the cell, then they affect the cell if that cell has the receptors for that particular hormone. The onset of peptide um, actions in, in terms of how they affect cells is quick in the um, peptide hormones. It's relatively slow in the steroid hormones. And you can understand why, because the steroid hormones have to basically get through that membrane and then find the receptors within the cell. Um, so that's a slower process in terms of the onset of the action of that hormone. The duration of peptide hormones is short. They kind of get their job done. They pass their message off there at the uh, receptor site along the membrane, whereas steroid hormones have longer durations of their effects. And again, this makes sense because they get all the way in there and now they can mess around with the stuff that's inside of the cell if the cell has those receptors. And so the main activity of the peptide um, hormones is protein activity. So what's going to happen is that the membrane that has that receptor is going to go ahead and have certain proteins that are created and those proteins go off into the cell to cause changes in the cell. Whereas the main effect of steroid hormones is when they get into, for instance, the nucleus of the cell, they're able to cause mRNA transcription, and then that, that kind of transcription process is going to be used then to possibly change the way that that cell uh, is structured or how it's going to respond. 
So those are the main ways that peptide and steroid hormones differ. And you'll see that I keep referring to peptide and steroid hormones throughout the rest of this lecture. Now, how does the brain control hormones? The hormones themselves are created at all sorts of different sites. Okay, so they're actually produced at different sites throughout your body. Some of them are actually produced in the brain. So here are the production sites of all these hormones. And you can see up at the top in the head, we have the pineal gland, the pituitary gland, the hypothalamus. Those are all sites for the production of hormones. We have the thyroid and parathyroid glands. We have the thymus, the pancreas, the adrenal glands, which sit on top of your kidneys. And then we have down there the testes and the ovaries. Um, they're also going to be involved in the production of different hormones. Now, the hormones that are produced at each of those sites differ. So each place sort of has a, a specialty of hormones that they, that site creates. We'll take an example though up in the brain of how the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland do their thing. Now the hypothalamus has many hormones that it can create. It can produce itself. The pituitary gland also has hormones that it creates. But here I want to talk about specifically how the hypothalamus can influence or control what happens at the pituitary gland. So in some ways, the hypothalamus is the master gland. It's the one that really uh, controls a lot of things that happen downstream. So in the hypothalamus pituitary connection that you can see depicted here, I just am showing you the pituitary gland in this picture, but imagine that the hypothalamus is just a short distance away, just above there. And what's happening is that there is going to be a connection being made between the hypothalamus and the pituitary. Um, there's the pituitary itself can be broken down into two parts. So you have the anterior or near the uh, the front of the pituitary and then with the posterior, the back part of the pituitary. So there's this anterior lobe and the posterior lobe. The anterior pituitary is affected by hormones that are released by the hypothalamus. So interestingly, even though the hypothalamus is close by, the anterior pituitary, it just has receptors that are waiting for certain hormones that come from the hypothalamus to bind there and then cause their changes. Over on the other side though, the posterior part, you can see it's affected by nerves and neurotransmitters that are released by the hypothalamus. So the posterior lobe of the pituitary is being controlled by the hypothalamus through nervous action, through nerves. So nerves are gonna come down and have neurotransmitters and the neurotransmitters are gonna be released there at the cells of the, uh, of the posterior lobe of the, lobe of the pituitary. And then depending on what the messages are from the uh, hypothalamus, you can see that the anterior and the pituitary, uh, posterior lobe of the pituitary, they release different hormones. And they'll, they're not gonna release them all at once, so they're gonna release whatever the message was that came from the hypothalamus about which hormones need to be released. So let's go ahead and talk about all these many hormones that come out of the pituitary. So in the anterior pituitary, there's several there, but I'm just gonna focus on three. We have ACTH. ACTH is important because what happens there is that the hypothalamus is again going to release a hormone called CRH to the bloodstream. And then when the blood happens to have some uh, CRH in it, the anterior lobe has receptor cells there and it's gonna cause ACTH to be released. So in it itself, the, uh, it, it was activated by a hormone in the hypothalamus. Now it releases a hormone that gets put out into the bloodstream. So now you have ACTH out there in the bloodstream moving around the body. And eventually it reaches the adrenal cortex of the kidney where ACTH can then uh, cause the, the adrenal gland to release hormones that are called glucocorticoids that we talked about at the last lecture. We also have TCH, a hormone that's released by the pituitary gland that will be picked up by receptors at the thyroid gland and that the thyroid gland will then have thyroid hormones released. We have FSH and LH that will signal to the sex organs that they're supposed to release uh, testosterone or estrogen or whatever it happens to be. So that's again, hormones that are being released by the pituitary gland that then downstream are going to affect the production or uh, sorry, the release of hormones at other places. So this is really sort of in a very indirect way where the hypothalamus has certain hormones that it's releasing. The anterior lobe of the pituitary has receptors for each of these different kinds of um, hypothalamic hormones. And then depending on which receptors get activated in the anterior lobe, that will be then what happens to be uh, the, the little vesicles that have those hormones and then will be released according to the messages that it's getting from the hypothalamus.
I find this just utterly fascinating how complicated this can all be in such a small little region there, a small little part of the brain. Now on the posterior side, we have hormones that are just sort of directly released out there into the body and they have very widespread effects in terms of both structural changes and activation changes. Um, and that would include vas vasopressin or vasopressin and oxytocin, which we'll talk more about later in this lecture. All right, now that you see a little bit about how that works, let's go ahead and just drill down a little bit more on a specific uh, um, connection there between the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. And this is known as the HPA axis. So you can see I've got in this drawing here a schematic of the hypothalamus, and then it's releasing a hormone called corticotropin releasing hormone. So it's got this cortic corticotropin releasing hormone, CRH, that then is going to be um, activating uh, cells in the anterior pituitary because those cells have this receptor for CRH. And then in turn, that's going to cause those cells in the anterior pituitary to release ACTH, the adrenocorticotropic hormone, ACTH, that then gets circulated out into the blood. And then while it's out there in the blood, there are receptor cells in the adrenal cortex that sits right there on top of the kidney that are then going to release glucocorticoids. And one of the glucocorticoids that's really important that we talk about a lot is cortisol. So cort there is standing for the hormone cortisol that then goes out into the body. So cortisol is sometimes dubbed the stress hormone. So if you can measure cortisol, you can usually use this as an index of how stressed out, for instance, the human is. So it's produced in the adrenal cortex as a result of that ACTH stimulation which in turn was stimulated by the CRH that was produced in the hypothalamus. So it's a chain of events here. H is for hypothalamus, P is for the pituitary, A is for the adrenal cortex. That's what we mean by the HPA, index, um, HPA axis. Now every hour, there are gonna be about two to three pulses of CRH released out into the bloodstream by the par parvocellular neurons of the hypothalamus. And the largest of these pulses actually happens in the morning when you're just waking up. So we have this sort of um, uh, cortisol response that's really quite big in the morning because it's basically like your body saying, hey, wake up, get things going here. And so you get these really big um, pulses of CRH happening then, which are gonna cause then ACTH to be released and eventually lots of cortisol to be released into the bloodstream. During acute stress, that amplitude of the CRH pulses increases, and then ultimately it results in um, more and more increases in quartz. So you're gonna see increasing pulses of CRH going to the anterior pituitary, and then at a certain threshold, there's gonna be even more of this, and the anterior pituitary is just gonna start cranking out ACTH, and the ACTH is gonna go ahead and cause cortisol to be produced. Now you'll notice that I also have in this drawing something that says negative feedback, because now once the hormone is out there, the cortisol is out there in the bloodstream, it's starting to accumulate like in larger and larger amounts based on what kind of stress is happening. And you can see that with negative feedback, that means that there are receptors in the anterior pituitary and in the hypothalamus for cortisol. And the receptors there pick up a certain amount of cortisol and it can have a downgrading of the uh, production of CRH and ACTH then. So both the anterior pituitary and the hypothalamus are measuring or gauging how much cortisol is out there in the bloodstream. And when it gets to a certain amount, it's like, okay, got enough out there, we need to shut down production. And so that feedback loop keeps it kind of in a steady state, sort of like homeostasis, okay? So overall, what cortisol's effects are, like why in the world is the body releasing all that cortisol? Well, primarily it's gonna to help to restore homeostasis after the acute stress. So your brain is basically saying, hey, there's something stressful going on here. And as the stress happens, we're gonna have CRH being released by the hypothalamus, which is gonna cause the ACTH to be released, and then the cortisol. And now the cortisol and these other glucocorticoids are out there. And it's counteracting, for instance, insulin by breaking down glycogen, leaving more glucose in the blood because that might be needed at that point because of the stress. It inhibits the loss of sodium. It retains salt when you have increased cortisol. It increases your water excre excretion. It's basically a diuretic. It makes you wanna pee when you have more cortisol. It weakens the activity of the immune system. Okay, so you're more likely to become sick when cortisol levels are higher um, because the cortisol is sh shutting down basically a lot of the activity of the immune system. It also enhances memory for short-term emotional events. 
So it's saying, you know, perhaps you need a lot of focus right now because you got this stressful thing going on in your life. Um, but it also is going to impair your memory if it, the cortisol is at too high of a level. So it's enhancing our short-term memory for these emotional events. But it's, if it gets too high, it's going to impair it. And then it increases our blood pressure through more vasoconstriction. So that's another thing it's doing. It's increasing our blood pressure as the cortisol is being released out in the blood. And finally, it inhibits secretion of the CRH, that negative feedback loop I told you about when it gets uh, received up at the hypothalamus. But this probably breaks down when we are exposed to chronic stress. So if, in fact, you're chronically stressed, you know, I'm, acute stressor just means like, you know, very loud noise is your acute stressor and you have all these things happen to it. But imagine you're in a stressful living environment, like where the noise just goes on and on and on, or there are just a lot of emotional events that create a lot of um, stress in your life. Then what this is saying is that the, the backward loop there, that negative feedback loop is sort of breaking down. It's not going to work as well. And so you're just going to keep on cranking out more and more cortisol in this sort of chronic sustained way. So you can imagine then, of course, if your cortisol is just high all the time, if you're stressed all the time, these effects that it's having on the body are going to be detrimental to your health. Now, people look a lot at cortisol in psychological research. We're going to talk about it again and again in social neuroscience research. This is just a really simple study by Andriana on Cahill in 2006. It kind of shows you the effects of a simple stressor. And so they're measuring salivary cortisol, because you remember one of the ways you can measure um, hormones is through saliva samples. So you can measure cortisol this way. And what you can see is that baseline, what people's levels of, um, of the hormone were, and then what happened 15 minutes later. And the two, um, yeah, the two solid lines in this diagram show us what happens when uh, the participant stuck their finger, uh, sorry, their finger, their, their fist inside of an ice bucket. So there's a bucket of ice that's really, really cold. It's sort of painful to keep it in there. As the minutes pass and your fist is in there, it gets more and more stressful because it hurts to have your um, fist in there. And what people do is they, uh, when they do this as research, they just say to the participant, please keep it in there as long as you can. And when it gets too bad, you can just pull your hand out. So that's what we mean by the cold presser treatment here. But anyway, you can see that um, what's, what's happening is they have a, um, ice condition, and then they also have a warm bucket of water condition. And for um, the participants, so you can see there's a big difference between um, men, uh, between the ice and the warm bucket conditions for men, um, and then there's less of a of effect there for women. Um, and they, on the idea on the right is they're actually showing how this affects memory. And so you remember I told you about how memory can affect, um, be affected by your cortisol levels. And this particular study was trying to show how these short-term changes in cortisol may be affected by gender or sex of the participant. And so you can see here there's an interaction between whether you're male or female and how much you can recall during this short, uh, stressful experience. But it's not really important for you to understand these findings. I just wanted to show you how you could possibly look at this in the laboratory ethically. <laughs> you could stress people out by having them voluntarily put their hand in this bucket of ice and then measure from two saliva samples, once at baseline, once 15 minutes later, to see if there's a difference in cortisol. Now, I just want to finish talking about cortisol a little bit here by talking about some long-term states or conditions that are correlated with very, very big HPA axis changes. So if you wanted to um, investigate sort of like the health effects of cortisol and stress, one of the things that we'd see is that any of these particular situations or states that have happened to a person will result in increased HPA axis activity. So this means that the HPA is just pumping out cortisol there at the end and glucocorticoids over and over and over again. So these are people who, are, who have melancholic depression or anorexia, panic disorders, diabetes, obesity, even childhood sexual abuse. All of those states are correlated with uh, a, a now an adult who has high HPA axis activity. And that means that they're sort of basically stressed all the time. Interestingly, you can also have decreased HPA axis activity. So it means that basically your body doesn't respond very well to stress because it's sort of low acting and it doesn't create very much cortisol during times of stress. 
And so states that are associated with decreased HPA access activity include seasonal depression, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, post-stress drug withdrawal, rheumatoid arthritis, and postpartum depression. So all of these uh, show activity from the HPA going down sort of chronically, and therefore maybe the body isn't having a healthy response to stressors because it's got decreased HPA axis activity. All right, so that's just again an example of how the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland work together to have um, hormones being passed around in the body. And of course, we're gonna talk a lot more about cortisol and stress and, and these sort of hormones later in the course. Now I wanna talk about next is how hormones actually do their influencing of the brain. So, so far we've been talking about how the brain influences hormones and how hormones then are passed around out in the body. But we can also look at how hormones influence the brain. And I've already given you a hint at this in the way that, for instance, in the HPA axis, we have these negative feedback loops where there are receptors in the hypothalamus and in the pituitary gland that can pick up glucocorticoids. And, um, you know, and as a result of that, they may down-regulate or down-change the amount of um, cortisol that gets produced. So there are three things here uh, that to pay attention to about how um, how the hormone can how hormones can influence the brain. First of all, hormones have to affect the brain by passing through the blood-brain barrier. So I'm going to talk about that in a moment. You've heard about the blood-brain barrier before. Let's go ahead and just say a little bit about what that is and then how hormones have to get through that. The second thing is that once they get through the blood-brain barrier, they get to a particular um, group of neurons. The neurons there have to have the right receptor, right? So it's not that hormones just wash through all over the body and all over the brain at the same time. There's going to be specific receptors at specific locations in the brain, and they'll be clustered as a result of that. So for instance, we have specific glucocorticoid receptors in the brain that are clustered just in certain brain areas the most, where they're going to be particularly sensitive to whether or not glucocorticoids are out there in the bloodstream. And then third, once it reaches the right receptor and the hormone binds with the membrane, it has to have some sort of influence on the neuron. So let's talk about, talk about that first thing, uh, the, how, the, how the hormone gets past the blood-brain barrier. So getting past the blood-brain barrier. Now, what is the blood-brain barrier? It's a basically a mechanism that keeps most chemicals out of the brain. Okay, and what it really means is that, well, first of all, before I say what it is, why do we need it? We need it because the brain lacks the immune system that's found in the rest of the body. And so we need this blood-brain barrier um, to keep pathogens from entering the brain cells and then possibly getting us sick. So the blood vessels that circulate all around the brain, there's a whole network of these blood vessels, have to keep those pathogens from entering neurons, entering brain cells. So how does it do this? Well, it does it with these endothelial cells that line the capillaries of your blood vessels. And they kind of like create this lattice network here that's really tightly joined. And it creates a seal then that blocks most molecules from passing from the blood into the surrounding nerves or the surrounding neurons. So endothelial cells are the main barrier there that we're talking about. And the, the barrier is actually in each of the blood vessels. And you know, there's thousands and thousands of these blood vessels throughout your brain. And all of them have that lining of endothelial cells. Now, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and some other molecules can pass through that membrane passively. So they can come to that membrane um, at certain locations and just the oxygen gets passed through the membrane in a passive process. They, you remember I told you it's sort of like the endothelial cells are like in this tight network and in this tight joint network it still leaves some spaces there for oxygen, carbon dioxide, and other molecules to cross passively through the barrier. Other necessary chemicals such as glucose. We need glucose to keep our neurons firing and then basically that's what fMRI and PET are trying to look at. Um, they're getting into the brain from the blood vessels through an active transport system. So there are little pumps there at certain locations along the, um, the blood vessel, along these capillaries, that allow those particular chemicals because they'll bind with that pump and then the pump pumps it through and makes it go to the other side to where the neuron is. So that's the active transport system. So it's very similar to the way we talked about the sodium uh, potassium pump in the actual individual neuron. There's, an, there's pumps like this in these blood capillaries that are going to allow certain necessary chemicals like glucose to pass through.
Now, I tell you all of this because one of the things that, of course, are being passed in the blood vessels are hormones. So the hormones are being passed diffusely throughout the entire body, right? And so, for instance, you have your cortisol in the blood. And so if the blood is going to bring cortisol up to the brain, the cortisol is going to have to affect the brain somehow, right? And how does it do this? Well, both steroid and peptoid hormones can pass through the barrier using one of these two methods. And it just depends on which hormone that we're talking about. I think that peptide um, hormones can easily pass through the membrane, if I remember correctly. And then the steroid hormones get done through um, the pumping, the active transport system. But nevertheless, whatever the system is that they use, their method, um, peptide and steroid hormones get through the blood barrier to act on certain um, neurons. Okay, so that's the first thing that these, how the hormones are influencing the brain. So they're getting actually through the blood barrier. All right. The second thing is that once it gets through that blood barrier and gets to a specific neuron then in the brain, the neuron it, that it reaches has to have the right receptor. And for any given hormone, there's only a subset of neurons that have that right receptor for the hormone to bind with its membrane. I have an example here of glucocorticoid receptors, okay? So these are, again, glucocorticoids are our stress hormones, including cortisol. And what this is showing you, this drawing, is the brain of the zebra finch, okay? The zebra finch is that pretty little bird down there in the photo. And if you do these careful studies that they have done, you can actually track where all of the glucocorticoid receptors are in a little finch brain. And it's, it's of course, uh, um, symmetrical, that is, there's like a left and a right, la uh, uh, left and right um, sides of the brain for the zebra finch, but it's just showing you here the glucocorticoids on the left, okay? So they would also be there over on the right. And you can see that they've got thick blue dots, medium sized dots, and tiny dots. And so the thicker the dots are, the more that they, the receptors are prominent in those particular areas of the brain. And the tinier means that there's, uh, you know, there's some receptors there for glucocorticoids, but they're quite. Um, limited. There's not as many of them. And of course, there's lots of other places in the brain where you see no glucocorticoid receptors. All right. So that's just an example of how, even though the glucocorticoids actually being passed evenly throughout the entire um, body through the bloodstream, only certain places in the brain, once it gets past that blood brain, blood brain barrier, do you actually have receptors that could take a glucocorticoid and then cause a change in the resulting neuron. And so once we find a place where that hormone can bind, it then has to influence the neuron. And this is again where we talk about how steroid and peptide hormones have different effects. So for instance, we could have our steroid hormones like the glucocorticoids coming in there and causing changes in the transcription of the mRNA, which maybe causes that neuron to fire differently, to um, change its dendrites or whatever it is. So the steroid hormones have their effects on the ner uh, nerves because of the way that they can bind then or pass through the membrane to then bind with the nucleus of the neuron and cause transcription and changes then in the way, for instance, the axon terminals are working or whatever. So you can see here, it just says steroid receptor dependent responses. They're different depending on what the different neurons are, but that's how the steroid hormones could actually influence the neuron. Okay. So again, both peptide and steroid hormones can influence neurons and how they fire and how they grow, um, just like they do with other cells in the body. But what we've just done is showed you then how hormones can then affect the nervous system. So let's finish up this lecture by just highlighting three key hormones for social neuroscience. Now, there are going to be plenty more that we talk about in this course, but I just thought I'd go ahead and introduce three. Um, they're sort of like the three big star hormones, for at least for stuff I'll be talking about in social neuroscience. One is obviously cortisol, and I don't really need to say much more about it right here. It's that stress hormone. I've already talked about it in previous slides about how the HPA axis can produce cortisol. Another hormone, though, is the oxytocin hormone, which we mentioned is produced by the posterior pituitary, both in men and women. It's a peptide hormone, and so we'll talk about that in a moment. And then finally, we have testosterone, which is a steroid hormone. It's released by the testicles in the male and uh, males and ovaries and females. And as what's interesting about that is then when it gets released into the bloodstream, adult males have about seven to eight times the levels of testosterone compared to adult females. So both males and females have testosterone in them, but it's just that men have much higher levels of testosterone compared to adult females. 
All right, let's look at these three hormones just in, in a couple of case examples here. One is we can look at hormones in paternal care, okay? Now, of course, mammals have paternal care. Um, specific brain systems are gonna underline attachment for the infant to its primary caregiver. And a baby's first experience of love is often through touch and through nursing, okay? Now, in terms of all that, we have um, opiates and oxytocin and attachment. So attachment is this idea that proximity or closeness to the caregiver is gonna produce feelings of well-being for both the caregiver and for the child or for the infant. And then separation from the caregiver is gonna produce feelings of distress, particularly for the infant. Oxytocin and endorphins, these are opiates, um, they, what they do is they produce feelings of well-being when they're released. So oxytocin, particularly, is a hormone that's going to be produced during these times of attachment, times of touch. Okay, And so how does it do this? How does it affect the attachment? The way we know a lot about oxytocin is through work that's been done with prairie voles. So a prairie vole is this little cute creature you see here in the photo. And we know a lot about oxytocin from models that have been done by looking at how prairie voles uh, bond and and so on. So oxytocin is a peptide that's synthesized in the hypothalamus and it's released in the bloodstream by the posterior pituitary gland. And the receptors for the oxytocin are in the limbic system and the brainstem as well as in the reproductive system. So remember I told you how different hormones have different receptors throughout the body. Here we have some receptors for oxytocin that are actually there in the brain in the limbic system and the brainstem but also in parts of your body uh, that are involved in reproduction are also going to have receptors for oxytocin. So oxytocin is being released during this early bonding period between a parent and its child. Now, oxytocin and attachment from the infant's point of view, what about how does the infant get influenced by oxytocin? Well, right at birth, the mother is secreting oxytocin into her breast milk. And in the first two weeks after birth, there's gonna be an increase in oxytocin receptors in the newborn's brain. So again, the newborn has these receptors. Um, the oxytocin is being produced by the mother and being passed to the infant through its milk, and then it's digested and passed into the bloodstream. And so now there's all this oxytocin starting to float around in there. And within those first two weeks, there are a bunch of new receptors in the brain of the newborn that can take those oxytocin um, hormones in. So what's interesting is that these receptors tend to disappear while the infant is weaned. So eventually when the infant is no longer breastfeeding, you're going to see as it moves to that point, a decline in the oxytocin receptors. So some people have speculated that what's going on there is that the oxytocin is facilitating learning of the infant with its caregiver that's enhancing a conditioned response to not only the mom's smell, but also to other non-social stimuli that have to do with um, being cared for. And what happens, what you find is if you block the oxytocin, it decre decreases the capacity to learn this in other animals. So if there's some reason why oxytocin isn't going to be picked up by those receptors in the infant, you're going to see a decreased capacity for the infant to learn the mother's smell and all these other non-social stimuli that have to do with um, being cared for. So in terms of how this might affect parenting, we, uh, we can look at how um, love or caring for the child affects both the mother and the father. Um, oxytocin primarily is facilitating maternal behavior. Other neuropeptides don't do this. So for instance, vasopressin doesn't actually facilitate maternal behavior. Estrogen is another hormone that's critical to making all of this happen. Estrogen um, induces gene expression in the oxytocin gene. Oxy estrogen also regulates the number of oxytocin receptors, which occur in the same brain areas as estrogen receptors. So there's this whole connection between estrogen and oxytocin a lot in, in terms of that developing baby. Um, and oxytocin itself in adults seems to have a motivating effect. So when we have oxytocin um, being released in our adult life, even though we don't have an infant around us, what we can see is oxytocin has these effects on adult behavior that causes us to be motivated. And perhaps it's what causes us to be drawn to other people, for instance. We'll talk more about that in later lectures. Now, again, mothers and fathers, humans are quite unique in their parental paternal care and the fact that fathers do not usually undergo huge releases of hormones when the mother is giving birth, but they do still form attachment bonds to the infant.
So the challenge here is that there's plenty of research to show that that increased level of testosterone that males have actually inhibits caregiving behavior when you look at this in rats. So both male and female rats that have increased testosterone are less likely to care for their infant. So here we got this father that has got all of this testosterone inside of him. How in the world is he gonna be able to form an attachment bond to the infant? Well, interesting, one of the things that we do when we become a father, males, is that they start to decrease their testosterone then. And so there's lots of evidence that shows that fatherhood decreases testosterone in human males. So as the brain is picking up the fact that there's now a child to be responsible for, the brain is then also causing testosterone levels to drop, to not produce as much testosterone. And perhaps because that testosterone level goes down once the child is born, the father then is more likely to be able to bond and care give for the child. So this shows you that it's not just about oxytocin and vasopressin. Testosterone is also going to play a role here in parenting. While we're on the topic of testosterone, let me just say a little bit more about that because again, it's an important hormone that will affect uh, things that we talk about in subsequent lectures. It's usually associated with dominance and aggression. Um, and sometimes people think of it just being a negative thing. But James Dabbs, who was a social psychologist who was very much interested in testosterone back in the 80s and 90s, he argued that um, testosterone probably plays a role for behaviors of both heroes and rogues. In fact, he had a book called Heroes, Rogues, and Lovers, all about testosterone. And so what he was saying there is that, sure, it might cause aggression and be dominant to have high levels of testosterone. But another thing that he's found is that people who tend to do heroic things, that put themselves out there, um, like firefighters, for example, police officers, they tend to have higher levels of testosterone than people who don't put themselves in those particular uh, occupations or roles in society. So testosterone seems to have this sort of way of activating us to become braver, to compete more, to put ourselves out there. And so this is, again, remember, both men and women have this. And so as if we take a woman who has a higher level of testosterone versus a woman with a lower level of testosterone, we'll find the same kinds of relationships between dominance and aggression in a woman as we would when we look at different levels of testosterone in men. Now, I'll just give you one example here of how testosterone could be used in a social neuroscience way. And in order to do this, I'm gonna go ahead and show you this little video that comes from a um, recording that I made a few years ago when I was at the exhibition in Brisbane at the showgrounds, it's called the ECA. And I was actually at this uh, dog competition, a dog agility competition, and I was watching um, this and I recorded it. So I'm just gonna show it to you and then I'll explain to you the study, okay? so here is a um, agility competition. You're gonna see that this woman's walking her collie around in this course, and the collie has to do different kinds of things at different points along the way. All right, so in this study, they were actually studying the humans, not the dogs, okay? So in Meta et al. in 2008, they measured basal testosterone levels in men and women who are participating in these competitions as handlers, right? So like the woman that you saw there in the video. Each of these um, competitors provided a saliva sample 90 minutes prior to the competition. So this is like the baseline. 
And then they also competed. And afterwards, they were led their dogs through the agility course in front of the judges, the spectators, and other competitors. And finally, the results of the competition were publicly posted or announced. And then participants provided a second saliva sample approximately two and a half hours after the first. So there's a big period of time here, two and a half hours between the first time they took a sample and the second time. But a lot's happened in those two hours. Now here are the main findings. They actually assayed the saliva for both cortisol and testosterone. And what they did is they took these participants and they divided them up into those who had low testosterone and those who had high testosterone. So you can see that down there in the um, x-axis. So we have participants with lower testosterone and those participants with higher testosterone. And then the people in the middle are the people with average amounts of testosterone in them. Again, at the baseline, okay? And then what you can see is the change in their cortisol levels that happened when they won or when they lost. And so what you can see that winners basically had higher levels of cortisol um, if they, I'm sorry, they had lower levels of cortisol if they um, uh, have won the competition. So you can see that it's going down there. It's like a lower level, it's that uh, dashed line. People who lost the competition had higher levels of cortisol, more stress. Now, among those people though, that are in the low testosterone condition, you can see there's really no difference between winners and losers. They don't really show a big change in their cortisol. But the people who have high testosterone, when they lost the dog competition, they had the lowest, uh, sorry, the biggest rise in, in cortisol, whereas um, the high T people who won dropped in their cortisol the most. So you can see the biggest difference between cortisol changes for those competitors who have high testosterone. So you imagine they're going even to a dog competition and they have that high testosterone level there two and a half hours or 90 minutes before the competition. That has a lot to do with how they respond then to winning and losing, how stressful they find it. Whereas again, low testosterone people showed no differences in their cortisol when they won or lost. So it's interesting to see how two different hormones here can interplay and be related to each other in terms of a social behavior of winning or losing a competition, a competition like dog agility. All right. Let's move on then to our um, to end this lecture by just reviewing again what I've covered here. I've talked about how cells communicate with another with each other. We talked about what hormones do. We've talked about peptide versus steroid hormones, hormones, how the brain controls hormones, how the hormones influence the brain. There were three ways we talked about there. And then I mentioned these three key hormones to know for the course, and that would be cortisol, oxytocin, and testosterone. But of course, there are many other hormones we'll need to pay attention to. So I thank you very much for listening and watching this lecture, and I'll see you next time.